Some time back, I got a series of texts from my client that said, Hi Clevers, I'd like to commission you for two pieces. Number one, for my husband's 45th birthday in December. And she went on to describe this painting, which will be the subject of our video. She said, My husband always wanted an oil painting of himself in armor, so I figured maybe you can recreate this with a Kahinda Wiley photo as inspiration. I'm thinking the floral background with the armor and a great facial picture. I'd like for you to use this picture for his face and hair and add a crown to his head. Hopefully this makes sense. Now it did make sense to me and that's why we have this video. But before we get into painting, I'm gonna give a brief overview of who Kehinde Wiley is and why I found this an exciting project. Kehinde is an African-American painter and sculptor who I first learned about in 2017 when it was announced that he would be painting the then outgoing president Barack Obama's official portrait to appear in the National Portrait Gallery. I started following his work then through to when that iconic portrait was unveiled and to this day he's been one of my biggest newfound inspirations and maybe even with time his influence may start creeping into my work. It's fascinating to listen to him describe his process and why he paints and sculpts the way he does and I'm gonna leave some links in the description of this video to a couple of interviews and features about him that would be a good place to start if you'd like to learn more about Kehinde Wiley. Other than the underlying message of his work, both in general and in specific, what usually stands out for me in Kahinde's work is the patterns and the designs he creates as the backgrounds to his portraits. I don't usually do this sort of thing with my backgrounds ever, but with this exciting commission I had to dig deep and see if I can find some Kehindeism in my repertoire. So keep his work in mind as you watch me try to paint like Kehinde Wiley. After priming my canvas with white silk vinyl paint, I then cover it in a neutrally colored layer of acrylic paint, in this case grey, that's going to act as my background for the underpainting. But before we get to the underpainting, I start by drawing equally spaced lines, both vertically and horizontally, to create a grid that will help me to find something close to the accurate proportions of this portrait. I'll then mix some oil paint with a lot of solvent, the solvent I'm using in this case is kerosene, to create a viscous fluid that will help me to draw lines across the surface of the canvas the same way a pen would draw on paper. You may notice that in the section of the canvas where I'm going to have my model's face, I've added more grids than in the other parts. And the implication of this is that the smaller these grids are, or the closer the lines are to each other, then the more accurate the proportions are going to be. So in parts like the face where you can't afford making big mistakes, it's usually advisable to try and be more careful with the proportions. But in other parts, of course, there could be some wiggle room. As to how I'm doing this, I've drawn a similar grid on the reference image. So what I'm doing here is simply follow the way the contours of his face and other parts of this painting or this image interact with the grid. And then that's what I'm now copying on canvas. When I'm satisfied with the outlines, it's now time to mix up the colors that are going to form the underpainting. I've used oil before for this stage, but nowadays I tend to lean more towards using acrylics because they dry much faster, which means I don't have to spend a lot of time waiting for the underpainting to dry before I can get to the oil painting part of the, you know, the oil painting. I'm creating a gradient now that flows from dark to light and it stays neutral in that the darkest color in this gradient isn't black and the lightest one isn't white, so all the colors are somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. This is so that if the final layer is going to have either black or white, it will be easy to distinguish the parts that have been painted on with the final oil layer from the parts that haven't. I can now start following the outlines by focusing on one color till I exhaust it and moving on to the next. Remember, the gradient I created in the palette only had five levels from dark to light, so it's quite easy to simplify every shade or every tint in the painting into those five. If I numbered the colors in that gradient from darkest to lightest as one to five, so one, two, three, four, five, I first start painting the other painting with, with number one, then I move on to number two, so these are the shadows, the darkest ones. Then I skip over to the other side of the spectrum and start painting number five, followed by number four. Then all the remaining sections will be covered in three. That's been my quickest approach to creating an underpainting so far. For the underpainting section, I don't have to blend in any colors or focus on any details because for one, the underpainting is going to be completely covered by the time I'm done with the painting. And secondly, the whole point of this step is for you to guide me in the next stage. So all the mistakes that I make here or all the things that I don't focus on in this stage, I will focus on in the next. 
One thing about acrylics though is that their fast drying times, even though they're an, an advantage on canvas in that they won't keep me waiting long before I can get to painting the next layer, on the palette there's something of an annoyance because unless you can find a way to cover your palette so the paint doesn't dry quick, you're gonna have to keep mixing the same colors over and over again at least every hour or so. so it's the other edge of that sword, no pun intended, but the upside definitely outweighs that little annoyance. And now that I'm done with the underpainting, for the final layer that's done in oils, I'm gonna take a different approach. So in this stage, you can see I've started by painting the background and I haven't mixed the paint with any solvent or any medium because a lot of the times i actually like the viscosity of oil paints as it comes from the tube but in some cases say if you want the paint to flow like i was doing when i was painting the outlines earlier on it would have been advisable to then mix it with some solvent like i did usually when painting i start with the background then gradually paint the items or the elements in front of the background until we get to the foreground and my reasoning behind this is usually that whatever is in front or closest to your eye is usually on top of or overlapping what's behind it and so when i'm painting i like to create such kinds of overlaps but in some cases you can break that rule or at least i can break that rule because in this painting for instance the model's face and background don't come into any contact visually once again because his locks separate his face from the background and so in this case one doesn't touch the other so i'm gonna start by painting the face then i'll move on to the background and finish with the hair later so after mixing up all the colors that would make his skin color in different sections, I'm gonna start by creating a translucent layer. And this is one of those cases where I need to mix the oil paint with a bit of solvent. I'll then use the underpainting, which is kind of visible underneath this translucent layer of oil paints in the same way that I use the grid. And the underpainting in this case will help me to create even more accurate outlines. And so all the mistakes in proportions that I may have made both when using the grid and when creating the underpaintings are being fixed in this stage. And obviously, if I did this again in a further stage, it would be even more accurate. But in my process, these second outlines are the ones that usually get it right. This is a bit of a longer and more carefully considered process. And the way I do it in this stage is having painted the translucent layer on the underpainting, I take a picture of it, open it on Photoshop, Place the reference image on top of it and reduce the opacity of the reference image. Then try and copy the way the reference image kind of interacts with the translucent layer. So in this case, I'm painting the outlines of the actual reference image in the same way that I did earlier when I was using the grid. It's just a bit more complex, but it's the exact same principle. And once again, just like I focused on one color when creating the underpainting, then moving on to the next while following the outlines, I'm just going to do the exact same thing, but this time with oil paints. And for this part, just like I did with the background, I'm not mixing the paint with any solvent or any medium because I don't need it to be too runny. And sometimes when I'm having trouble getting the proportions of a face right, even on top of this layer, I usually come back and redo the whole process again, but now I use this one as the guideline. So the guideline gets more and more accurate with the time, such that by the time I'm done with it, maybe on the third or the fourth try, I've definitely nailed the proportions by then. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Anyway, as you can see, this part isn't very different from how I created the acrylic underpainting. The difference in this case is that oil paints take a long time to dry, which actually comes in handy in this stage because I wouldn't like for this to dry fast. And the reason why I wouldn't want that is because I want to blend these colors in. Remember in the underpainting, I wasn't blending anything. I was just laying in the colors and leaving them there. In this case, I'm going to need to blend them. So after creating all these different colors and I'm making them vibrant because I'm trying to kind of mimic the saturation in most of Kehinda Wiley's paintings, I'll then clean a soft brush on a piece of canvas and use it to kind of blur the borders between all these different colors so that they seamlessly transition into one another. When I'm done painting his face, I will now mix the colors that will make the background or at least the flowers that I plan to paint on top of the background and by now the background is completely dry because burnt amber, which is the color that I've used for that background, dries faster than any other color. And so while I was working on the face, which took about five or six hours, the background was drying. So now it's possible to paint all these new colors on top of it without having them mix with the burnt amber of the background. My choice of the kind of flowers I'm using in this stage is mostly visual. So this isn't like a Hindu's Obama portrait where the different flowers he used were picked from different parts of the world that represented President Obama's familial and political life. 
mine are less laden with meaning and if I'm honest I can't even name these flowers, I just happen to like how they look. In painting these flowers I'm not using any solvent with the oil paints because in some sections you can see I'm trying to kind of blur them into the background or kind of make them fade at the ends which is impossible to do when the paint is loaded with solvent or medium. So I'll move from color to color and create different flowers of different colors and on the palette as well while I'm mixing the colors of these flowers I'll create their darker versions or the colors that will form their shadows by simply mixing those colors with some burnt amber. Usually when I'm painting I use the same color for the shadows in every section of the painting. By this I don't mean they'll be casting a shadow on anything since it's more of an abstract background but as you can tell from the way I'm painting it the darker flowers appear to be further into the distance than the brighter ones. I'm not going to use many colors for these flowers because I want the background to be predominantly dark with the green flowers showing more than any. So other than the two types of green I've already painted, I'm going to add some brown, some blue and a bit of pink. But as random as that selection looks, this choice is not random. I tested different combinations in the sketching stage of this painting, so I figured out this tray would give me a look in which there won't be too much color clashing. Now as they are they look kind of flat so I'm gonna need to make some of them stand out and of course to make the flowers that are closest to us pop even more. When I'm done painting all these different colors I'll then use some white to indicate the highlights but since I want the background to be generally dark I won't overdo it so just a few white dots will be enough to give the hint that some of the flowers are brighter lit than others. With the background done I can now move on to painting the rest of the model so I'm gonna start with the crown because even though he has hair the hair is kind of on top of the crown so in the same way that I painted the face the translucent layer will be followed by a layer of shadows then a layer of mid-tones and finally a layer of highlights. It helps to have a variety of brushes because as you can tell I'm creating different effects with different kinds of brushes so in some cases I want the lines or the colors to be kind of blurry and in other cases I don't. A bit of inside information here but in case you're wondering where I got this crown from, it's inspired by Denzel Washington's character's crown in the tragedy of Macbeth which I was watching while I was painting this portrait. In any case, after the crown, I'll then move on to the hair but in this case only the hair that's behind his suit of armor and those locks that fall on top or in front of the suit of armor will be painted after I'm done painting the suit. Since his hair is black, or more accurately burnt amber, I'm going to get the highlights and the mintons by mixing that burnt amber with a bit of yellow and a bit of white. And I'm using yellow for all the characters' highlights because I want the lighting to have a kind of warm feel. If I wanted it to be kind of cool, I would have gone with blue. And now it's time for the suit of armor itself. So after painting the translucent layer or the local color, in this case I'm going to start by painting some yellow glazes that will make it look kind of golden and also some light green reflection from the mostly green flowers around him. After that I'll move on to the shadows and this is now a process that you probably been now a bit familiar with since it's the same way that I did the face but there's a bit of a difference in that in this case obviously I'm not using the extra layer of outlines like I did with the face because I don't have to be as precise as I was with the face and something else which is in some sections of this sort of armor I'm going to be building up the darkness of the shadows gradually so in some parts I'll start with the darkest version of burnt amber but in others I'll start with a kind of muted version of it then slowly build up the darkness and the way I create that muted version is simply by rubbing or cleaning the brush on a dry piece of canvas after picking the paint from the palette so that when I apply it on the main canvas where the painting is the color whichever it is won't be as saturated as it otherwise would be so an example of that is when I'm painting like at this point the shadows of the locks that are going to be in front of the suit of armor and afterwards also the patterns on the suit of armor itself. This part involves a lot of symmetry and a few straight lines neither of which are my strongest suit so it takes a bit more concentration than usual to try and get it right especially freehand but the focus eventually pays off and now I can start shading all the shadows. And for this part I will gradually build up the level of darkness of the shadows 
unlike how I did it with the first whereby I started with the darkest shadows then after painting the final shadow on this suit of armor in this case that of another flower that I intend to place in front of our model I will then move on to the highlights and in this case I'm going to paint them while avoiding the sections where the shadows are so in this case for example I'm painting them around the shadows of the locks then of course on the crests or the parts that are raised facing the light source I'm also going to paint these sort of highlights Mintons and highlights tend to be the simpler part of my process because by the time I get to them, all the heavy lifting is usually already done in the shadow section because in the case of this section, for instance, I didn't have anything to guide me when painting these patterns with the shadows. And so it was a lot more work figuring out where to draw these lines. But by the time I get to the mintons and the highlights, all the lines are there. So all I have to do is simply identify those parts of the sort of armor that appear to be raised or facing the light and paint on them the main tones and the highlights. The gloves are a much simpler affair since given that they're much darker than the suit of armor for instance they won't have any reflected light on them so i'm just going to create their mid-tones by mixing burnt amber with a bit of white then the highlights with even more white but again not too much And now that I'm painting the locks themselves, you can tell the difference between the kind of muted shadows I was using before and burnt amber as it comes from the tube. At the points where the locks touch the sort of armor, for those of them that do, I'm going to darken the shadows underneath just a bit to create a sort of occlusion shadow. And then just like I've just done with the gloves, I'm then going to paint in the mid-tones followed by the highlights. I'll repeat the same process on the other side and after we're done with painting the model it's now time to paint the sword he's holding. I'll use masking tape to block in the sections of the sort of armor that I don't want any of the sword to kind of extend to but of course to do this the sort of armor or whatever else would have been underneath has to be completely dry otherwise when peeling off the masking tape it may carry some of the paint with it and ruin your work. I'm going to use multiple masking tapes to create multiple effects and afterwards I'll peel it off and as you can see the paint underneath stays intact. Then comes the handle which itself won't be a lot of work and after this a few more flowers and leaves in front of and around the model but not as many as the ones behind him because I still want him to be the center of attention something which a background of this sort would probably make tasking in itself. Of course I'm also doing this when everything in the back is dry so that it's easy for me to erase mistakes and also so that my palm or my hand has somewhere to rest on when painting these almost geometric lines. In this stage I'm also using the brighter version of the colors of the flowers because I'm assuming they're closer to the light than the flowers in the back and if I make them as dark as the ones in the back they probably won't stand out or they won't make much sense so that explains the difference in color you may notice with these new flowers and with that my work is pretty much done and i'm aware that with the background of this abstract it's possible to get carried away and probably overdo it so in this case for instance i would have crowded this model in too many flowers or even using too many colors that won't make much sense but since it's my first attempt at creating a painting of this sort i'm gonna have to be cautious and leave it here and in case you're wondering what I'm doing in this stage, I repainted some sections or some features of the face because I wasn't happy with the proportions and that extra layer of oil paints dried differently. So I'm just applying a bit of medium, which is linseed oil, to make it all look even. And after that, I believe my work here is done. So here is the complete painting. You can compare it with the image my client sent me and with Kehinda's work. And maybe let me know how you think I fared. In any case, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I did painting it. 
and I'm gonna leave you now with my client's husband's reaction upon receiving the painting. I just wanna capture your reaction on camera. You like it? I do. Really? I do. Yeah, this is really good. Happy birthday. Wow. Happy birthday. It's an oil painting. You what? I would have chosen this for myself. You would have? Mm -hmm. I love this. I don't really think about this. I'm going to hang this hat. You're welcome.